Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for our panel presentation by A. Rutan, The Art of Reimagined Materials. We are so delighted to be partnering with the Pacific Design Center and A. Rutan to launch the very first event for the PDC's new virtual program, Aesthetically Speaking, a virtual series engaging the brightest minds in design. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the president of A. Rutan, Spencer Rutan, who's here today. A little bit about welcome and be here as our, our sponsor. We're happy to have him. And Spencer, take it away. Thanks, Christine. Um, on behalf of myself and the Rudin family, we're honored to help sponsor this um, beautiful event. And I think that our host and moderator, Josh Cooperman, will lead an illustrious panel through a great conversation today. So I will turn it back over and enjoy. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Josh. Uh, we want to introduce you, and I will simply say before you talk about your background, um, Josh Cooperman is an accomplished speaker, writer, publisher, host, brand manager, producer, and product designer, and I'll let you, I'll let you tell them a bit more about yourself. Take it away. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Christine, and, and thank you, Spencer. So again, Josh Cooperman, um, I'm the host and producer of Convo by Design, a podcast for the design trade. Uh, I'm also the uh, director of broadcast media for Hudson One Media Group. And I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by this, as, as Spencer called it, an illustrious group. And, and you really are. And it's amazing. And I'm really excited about this topic as well, the art of, of reimagined materials. I think we, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Before we do, a couple of notes. If you have any questions, we most likely will not uh, jump out to questions at the end. But if you do have questions for our panelists during the, the conversation, if you look down, you'll see the, uh, the chat bubble down there. Please type your questions in and uh, we will do our best to get to them. With that, I'd like to sort of go around the horn and I'll, I'll call you out um, so you can sort of introduce yourselves for those who might not be as familiar with you. And I, Sue, I will start with you. Okay. Uh, Sue Firestone. Um, basically, my background was interior design for the last 40 years, and I moved into product design five years ago. Uh, I grew up in Malibu during the 60s and 70s, so that's had a huge influence on my product design. Uh, bohemian, back to nature, and um, so yeah, I, I'm enjoying product design very, very much. So I've got a line with A. Rudin, um, and fabric with Kravit, and fuse lighting, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, behind me is my boat, which the sailing around the world is the other influence I have in my life and career. Love it. Thank you, Sue. Nicole Landau. Hi. Uh, nice, nice to be here. Thank you so much, Josh and Christine and Spencer. So uh, my background is I've been a fine artist for the past 17 years, and I've worked primarily in a photography-based abstract um, contemporary art. And in the past two years, I've kind of jumped into sculpture. And my um, sculpture is often inspired by science and um, what inspires me in different, you know, the string theory or, or you know, different scientific theories. And, uh, and I'm really excited to show my work to you. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra. Hi, Sandra Block. Um, I had a long career, 30 years as an architect. And much of what we did, um, was in the public realm. So university projects, museums, um, and, and similar sort of work. Um, about six years ago, I launched Studio Vlock. And the relationship between the two is, is really important to me because as an architect, one of the most um, uh, important steps in the design process is programming. And as sexy as that sounds, what it really means is listening and listening for stories to connect people to where they are, whether it's a, a, a student center or, or a library. And so the work that I'm doing now, I am calling functional fine art, uh, repurposing certain things um, to reflect not only the history of those objects, but also to tell a story that is very much related to, to context, to nature, to uh, develop a sense of place. And so that's that's kind of a little bit of background of moving from one seemingly disparate field to another, but it, it, it does make sense to me. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, Mario. Hello there, how are you? My name is Mario Romano. 
I'm a designer and builder and maker and um, a pleasure to meet and speak with everybody. And I really focus on innovative architectural large scale products. And I'll just change some of my screens, whether it's large scale illuminated walls that are textured or facades that are undulating and responsive to the environment. And uh, we have a deal with Corian in order to make all these large scale objects for almost like you know decor, whether it's indoors, outdoors, we can do illuminated walls for restaurants or you know, bar backs for rest or homes, other kinds of feature walls. And what's really great is we can go indoors and outdoors. So it's really, it's innovation and building and ultimately how to plug into all these great architects and designers out there that want to um, be expressive, right? And so we can, we're like a bridge from the design world into the world of man, making and building. Thanks, Mario. So this title, the, the Art of Reimagined Materials, it's really funny. I just wanna sort of throw two ideas out there as we enter into this conversation. The first is, while I absolutely love seeing your beautiful faces, um, if we at some point get away from doing these virtually, say 90%, um, it would make me thrilled to no end, right? So we could get back to seeing real products and touching them and feeling them instead of changing our virtual backgrounds. The second thing is, and Sandra, you kind of touched on this, so I wanna to go to you first. You mentioned story. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, a, there is an open space now as it, as it relates to what exactly it means to have reimagined materials, right? It could be new, it could be old, it could be old and repurposed, it could be new and reimagined. So I'm curious, what, is, what does it mean to you? Um, you know, art of, separate, but the idea of story and reimagined materials. Well, storytelling engages people and it brings us around the campfire, so to speak. And when I mentioned programming a moment ago, that's the part of architecture that was just so important to me because it was an opportunity to really tune in to what is this place about? Who are these people? What matters most? The um, piece behind me is a fireball and how I got started in, all, in this storytelling on, on, on a different canvas that's not architectural, but is architectural in nature was taking a, uh, a used object, a functional piece, a mooring buoy, steel mooring buoy. And I use that as a canvas to tell a story in this the first case um, of a particular place, the, the, the coastal environment of uh, Connecticut. And I found that I could really um, express not only myself, but things that mattered to other people on this new canvas, and also create something that like architecture um, is, is about that sense of place, of, of a place to gather, to, to have a conversation, to really, again, engage people in, in something that can be shared. So that, that became a bridge for me to enter into something that was seemingly very familiar, but at a much more personal and, and intimate level. And you know, it's interesting, Sue, when it comes to that personal level as you evaluate materials to become finished products. One of the things that I know about you from our conversations is your love of travel. And as it relates to that love of travel, you have the opportunity to go away, to be inspired, to find new ways, new purposes. What is, is that a couple of things? First of all, is that where you find the majority of your inspiration? And as you've been sort of ideating for the last 18 months to two years, when travel wasn't necessarily something you could go do at, at, as you have in the past, how has that affected your sort of your creative flow with regard to how you approach material to become finished product? Well, I think that for me, the travel's always been an important part of, yes, to your point that I was stuck at home for almost two years and I think a lot of us were but so I sort of went back to for me my origins which is nature you know when I was wandering along the beach the tide pools of Point Doom you know barefoot and riding my horse down and, and charging into the water all of the, those elements went into my first initial product design in terms of things from that era to me um, expressing myself 
And now I'm looking forward to actually traveling again, but I've noticed again, the travel, I'm drawn to cultures that are still doing a lot of crafts, whether it's Polynesian, you know, tiki mask or an Alaskan um, carved elephant. Those are the types of things that really inspire me. And I think so crafts for me has been a huge inspiration my entire career more than man-made materials uh, and I think actually as opposed to man-made materials so I'm just curious as a, as a follow-up to that before Christine pushed the little red button and we started this uh, conversation you Spencer was on and you mentioned you have a collection with with a Rudin and there are 22 pieces in the collection I, I'm I'm curious too how that's all come together and how perhaps the the creativity change and inspirational change that, that you've been experiencing has added to that collection. That's a sizable collection. Yeah, and again, for me, the influence was um, California designers, but from the 70s and early 80s. And I've always sort of stayed away from mid-century modern because I think I grew up in that kind of household. So going back to really a natural look and Michael Taylor, Steve Chase, you know, the designers that were really they established the California look had a huge influence on me. Um, and back to the, you know, what I did for um, Spencer and his family was, you know, the first women, so it made me a little bit more feminine some, than some of their other product lines, mm -hmm. which was exciting for me. But I'll, also I've always loved wood. I fell in love with wood in one of my shops uh, in, in college. And so the piece that he was mentioning just has caught on as a live edge sliding tray over an ottoman and uh, literally people can't get enough of them and the thing that's inherently nice is each one is different because the wood that is found mm. is a different species every time a different size and so again the craftsmanship I think with what clients are drawn to and designers are drawn to that so um yeah and I look forward to Spencer designing a new product next year <laughs> That's great. You know, Nicole, jumping over to you, because of what you do uh, and your, your work is so unique. And I think, you know, just sort of dovetailing into what, what Sue was talking about when it comes to materials, I think the uniqueness of your work and the materials you use is, is perfectly suited. We're getting into like this deep dive, this conversation about reimagining, repurposing, reusing, um, and reimagining be the, being the keyword here of materials. I'm, I'm curious how the material affects your work and how you've taken that in sort of to new levels. And while I don't want to talk about the pandemic anymore, I really don't. I, I do think I do think that we would be remiss not to talk about how we've all, like reimagined materials, become re reimagined creatives. I don't know any creative in our industry who has not come out of this changed in some way, shape or form. And I'm curious how that's affected you. Well, I, I mean, I'd like to talk about just the material in itself because my process as an artist is I start with a concept and then the concept, I think, how am I going to realize this as, um, you know, as a sculpture? And then I search for the material and I've searched for the fabricator. So I have kind of this idea and I approach multiple fabricators and oftentimes I'll get many no's or they're confused by it or they don't, you know, I have this idea. And then I finally come across someone and they'll just say, yes, I get it. And this is how you're, you're, you can imagine it and, um, or, or realize it. And so that is the exciting part for me is kind of that seeking and problem solving and even on my current sculpture that I'm working on, um, which is a new sculpture, I'm actually um, went through five different fabricators and then ended up with Mario. <laughs> <laughs> and when I went to go visit his studio, I was on my way to go see a different fabricator. And he said, come by mine. I cut out of that one, went to go see Mario. And it was the exact thing that I needed to realize my sculpture. So it was very, it was like, an, it was an exciting moment for me because it's always at that point where I'm going through multiple people and then arriving. And, um, and then back to the, the um, you know, COVID and all of that, that kind of gave me a huge um, amount of time to actually work on different concepts and think about how I was going to, um, you know, work with, work with my ideas and reach out to different people 
it was really actually a, a very inspirational time for me where I made a choice to do something different in my career. And it's been a really exciting change for me. So Mario, I, I love this idea because I, I'm excited to have this conversation with you as well. You know, you've, you've, you work primarily as, as in the background, as in the walls with a product that was, that was crafted for horizontal use and you've reimagined it for a primarily vertical use, which I think is fascinating. And I'm curious, take me through the discovery process. Take me through the, the craftsman. Well, I don't know if it's, if we're talking more of the craftsman side or the artistic side, I think it's probably half and half. Well, I'm going to say, you know what, it's, I would say definitely craftsman, but it's also research. I think it's a research and discovery side, you know, and there's a, there's a Dutch approach to design and it's really um, very iterative, right? Which means the, when you get to the finished product, it's not really the end. That's really just the beginning to feedback into like a feedback loop of design, create, make, and then you keep cycling that to improve the overall process. So, um, you know, you go back where they really separated, you know, there was a time we had the master builder and the master builder was both the architect and the maker, and he wasn't divided. Just like a chef, you know, a chef, he does the cooking and the, the designing and very often at the same time. Well, we're actually returning back to that methodology where architects really want to make, right? And, and, architect, and builders really want to be able to be even more, more designers, right? So there's a bridge. So that's why, you know, working with Nicole, she plugged in really well because we like to think of ourselves as a, like a bridge between design world and the digital world and the actual fabricated or made world. Long way to answer your question is that it started off by starting small and very often in my own backyard where I did lots of mock-ups, um, lots of testing before I went to the large scale, whether it's, a, you know, before I was able to do a, a, a large scale skin, which is, you know, over an entire building or wow. entire like building like this, you know, I had to start in the backyard um, using CNC machining, experimenting with different materials. And the material that I found that gave me the most flexibility was the solid surface corian, you know, pretty much a countertop material, but actually it's used outside, it's used in other applications, but no one's ever really been able to create like a solution where we can get illumination. Mm -hmm. um, we can put it on the outside and get illumination. We can get curvature. We can get colors. We can go outside. We can go, you know, here we have curvature. This is all the way in Tel Aviv, Israel for a massive curved wall. Um, wow. We do showers. Um, we do, um, you know, branded logo. Well, now we're curving it where it's textured and it's illuminated, right? And it's bonded in monolithic. So all these qualities, there's only one material that can really get you all of that in one, you know, wood, metal, steel, um, they're not gonna be able to achieve all those characteristics. So it was those characteristics and then combining those characteristics with, you know, technology, right? Today's computational power, which is extraordinary, and the machines that are out there, really making that as a, as a language or a platform for other people to plug into, whether it's architects or designers or artists. So really, I, I think it's fascinating, and I wanna take the conversation from there, Sandra, back to you, because yeah. you know we've spoken about the, the fireball in the past and sort of the, the process of getting there. Talk to me a little bit about the discovery process. And here's where I'm going with this. I, I feel like anyone who has tried to specify something mm -hmm. in the last four months has come to understand. And it's so funny as I'm looking at each one of you, you're, you're like, mm, yeah, I know where he's going. And it's true. Anyone who's tried to specify something over the last four months has run up against a brick wall or a financial wall or an availability wall or something else that precludes them from being able to specify what they want when they want it, which means that it's it's been now sort of the responsibility has kind of passed over a little bit to the specifier to try to figure out, well, if I can't get what I want, how do I get what I need? And I feel strongly that this has created an artisan's mentality within the designers and the creators. 
So, you know, Sandra, that's why coming back to you, you know, you had this idea and we've talked about this mm -hmm. for, for reimagining something that was unused and would have sat there rusting away yep. until, until you, you sort of came up with the thought and an idea and reimagined it a way that it is beautiful and stunning and functional. Um, you gave something a second life. And, and I think it's important for everyone to, to hear your process. Well, you know, as I'm listening to everyone, I, I wrote, I've been writing notes down as I always do, um, that it's like the material told me, the, the, the object informed me in this case, as, which is very different from the architect trying to, as you say, to specify and you know, figure out how to get something to conform to that idea. So with taking a mooring buoy, which is steel, raw steel, eighth inch thick, um, and coming up with a, with a notion to transform it into a fire vessel, number one, um, kind of peeling it away like a big paper doll, like, gee, I wonder how much I can take away and it's still gonna, it's still gonna be round, <laughs> it's still gonna be there. I was really working with the imperfections of the piece to inform lots of different design decisions about it. So if it had a big dent or it had like some, some strange uh, you know, appendage to it, that just became part of the design. And working with, as I say, the, you know, the storytelling of whatever it is, maritime themed or something of the desert, my experience of being there and the critters that live in the desert or whatever, wherever I happen to be or whatever the, 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 the language of the piece would like to express, I was so influenced by the nature of the material itself because steel has dimensionality to it. Um, I mean, it, and sculpture of course is an experience, is something to experience. This was not a, a painting on the wall or a lot of the sketches that I had done throughout my life uh, stayed as two-dimensional pieces. So I was just enthralled by the nature of the material, allowing it to be weathered and rusted and express itself. Um, and uh, in terms of availability to that point, I've now started to work with other pieces, which are, hey, they're just there. You know, maybe this is another canvas I can explore. So one of the uh, the new works that I've designed, um, I'm calling fire totems, but it's taking the ubiquitous patio heater, which you see absolutely everywhere, certainly in Southern California, but really all over the world, which is like, wait a minute, that's, a, that's just taking up a lot of our visual real estate. What can I do with that as a, a new point, a new, a new focal point, a, a new opportunity to bring a second life to that piece. Yeah. Uh, and that's just fascinating to me. So it, whether it's stainless steel, which is its own world, <laughs> you know, it's, it has its own inherent qualities, which are so, so appealing. The, so that's, that's to, the, to the notion of like, well, you know, you know uh, how can we repurpose what we've got here to create a more animated, engaging, artful environment for the outdoor space? But I, I, I really do feel like I can only take so much credit for the work because it comes from the, from the object itself in part, which I'm, I'm totally enjoying. You know, Nicole, as, as Sandra's talking and, and, you know, in our conversations, one of the things that I just think you do remarkably well is how you craft the narrative behind the work. And I feel like art and story are inextricably tied hand in glove all the time. When, so for your new project that you're working on, how do you craft the story? Where does the story start? And how do you incorporate the intrinsic sort of like how, how Sandra's talking about the, the intrinsic qualities of steel? How do, you, how do you incorporate the intrinsic qualities of material within the narrative of your, of your, of your work? Uh, well, okay, so my, my first sculpture was based on the string theory and it was a visual interpretation uh, in light. So the, the sculpture progressively lights up in response to um, people, you know, either singing to it or 
playing music to it. And that all goes back to the string theory, the theory of everything, where everything comes from a vibration and it comes from music. So that was my first sculpture. My second sculpture, the story, you know, continued that story of, you know, everything is connected and the connection. This went into nature, which is an abstraction of a mushroom. My current sculpture that I'm working on is actually um, with L'Oreal, um, L'Oreal's new headquarters in uh, El Segundo in Los Angeles. So they have, you know, New York, Paris, and now they're opening Los Angeles. And for me, it, you know, it was a continuation. They were so inspired by my story about the string theory and connection. So I actually took that into, um, you know, what is important to L'Oreal as a company. And to them, it's kind of, um, you know, it's, you know, it's very, it's about women and women being powerful. And so it was kind of like that unquestionable belief in yourself. So I took that and actually the, the, um, the sculpture was inspired by a cocoon. So it was about weaving cocoon, the string back to again, the string theory where everything comes from a, spring, a string or a vibration. And so then the sculpture took on the form as an abstraction of a cocoon. And it was um, through repetition of that, um, of that symbol, it was we it weaves in and out of itself, and so they they were really so we actually are doing um, two sculptures. One is based on a cocoon. The other one, you know, a wing of a butterfly. So for them, it's you know it's about femininity, femininity and the potential and um, belief in that journey. So they were you know the story for me is is huge. You know, with with L'Oreal, I had to you know. The, my, my other sculptures, like you see here, are, you know, monumental, you know, I'm creating them and, you know, for L'Oreal, it was within a certain, um, you know, I was, I was designing it for them for their budget. And so to realize that and still have it be dynamic and exciting and, um, and have a story, because the story, I think, is, is super important to the piece. It, it, it adds a whole nother layer to, to it. Well, listen, I, I think we, we've all had enough conversations to know that what, you know, our, our business goes the direction of the client desires, right? Because the clients are the ones that dictate if they're going to buy product. Designers are the ones who are going to specify product on behalf of their clients. It has to go in the way of the consumer. And, you know, Sue, this is, this is coming in your direction because I, I think it's really interesting. You know, in our past conversations, you've mentioned and we've talked about this strong relationship you have with A. Rudin um, and the Rudin family. And, you know, telling the story, we, we've heard from clients and we've heard from designers on behalf of their clients. Clients want the story. They want the provenance. It's really important to them now not just how expensive it is, how luxurious it is, or how hard it may be to obtain, but what makes it special. It's really interesting. I want to throw something out there, out there that I, I've, kind of a theory, but I think it's, it's one that, that bears investigation. You know, a few years ago, five or six years ago, we were all, and you can take yourselves out of the equation if you want to, but I will pr firmly put myself there, this whole millennial, like, don't tell me what millennials want anymore. I don't want to talk about millennials and design anymore. But what's really interesting is millennials, the millennial consumer actually started something really interesting. They would buy one thing. They wouldn't spend a ton of money on the, maybe it was a pair of sneakers that they absolutely loved. It was a car. It was a watch. It was a piece of furniture. It was case goods. It was a work of art. But they bought one thing that they absolutely loved, that they felt a connection to and told a story. And then they would use remaining budget to build around that in a, in a, in a lesser fashion to some degree. But they always had that one thing that they could tell the story about. I feel like that has translated mainstream into design. I feel like that was a trend that millennials had started, but it has since caught on. And I feel like many people are going in that direction. And, you know, Sue, one of the things that you do just magically and incredibly well is you, you craft story with, within the material itself. The, you talk about driftwood, you know, you talk about certain materials and how the material fits intrinsically into the piece itself. I'm curious how you work with your showroom partner. So as you, you're working with 
A. Rudin and you and Spencer are having this conversation about a collection, you know, and a 22 piece collection is, is fairly large, but how each one has its, its unique story and overall how the entire collection has a narrative and a provenance to it. Where does that come from? And how do you, how do you sort of guide each other through what they need and what they feel they can sell and what you want to create and craft? Well, I think, you know, including with A. Rudin, uh, for me, it's the story is about me, my background, and, you know, a woman designer bringing that to A. Rudin and great family and uh, sort of approaching again, like I mentioned, the Malibu bohemian 60, 70 vibe, but also a slightly feminine, more graceful edge than some of the other products that they have designed by men. Um, and also, I, I like what we we're talking about too, is like where the piece itself becomes so important. Like for me, the live edge wood, which again, every piece is different, you know, making it kinetic so that it goes back and forth, but also there's other pieces where, again, it's a burl found incredible walnut piece, but it's held up by loose sides. So it's again, almost uh, not just a coffee table, it's a piece of, you know, wonder that is unique um to that so the, for me any manufacturer i go to whether it's a rude and lighting crab it, i start with who i am and what i love in my background so that's the beginning of the story and then of course the manufacturer they have their needs where is my story going to fit in and so it evolves and working very much closely hand in hand to evolve those pieces because i would say i started with maybe 50 pieces and then we narrowed it down and the same happened with crab it, where you know, hundreds and hundreds and basically narrowing it down to again, what they were missing in their whole overall. You know, they have 25 designers at any given time designing products. So it's not only my story, but it's what is needed by the manufacturer and what's missing in the, you know, for designers to select from. Mario, a similar question to you, be, because you, you start with, you know, a, a, a kernel of an idea sort of same question to you, how do you get to true desire uh, for a finished product through the limited information you're given? Well, that's a great question. Do you know what? That's, there's always a leap, you know? So I think sometimes it's, we get to create our own world and we get to create our own side and that sometimes people just trust us, right? And we have like some standard kind of base designs and, and products. But everyone seems to like to customize too, you know, and like the architects and designers, you know, for the most part, they want to roll up their sleeves and they want to have that influence or those, those fingerprints. And it can be very hands-on, you know, so it's a going back and forth process. Um, we have tools, digital tools, software tools that assist with that. So how can you speed up that iterative process where you may have a, an idea, like let's say it was, um, you know, a particular, you know, native, uh, you know, plant that was only, you know, um, uh, for a particular area of the United States, like that may be really symbolic. And then, so maybe that we could start with a photograph, or maybe we could start with um, like a very basic line sketch. And just those, or even sometimes some verbal concepts, we'll take even just words, right? Something heavy, heavy blocks, right? Very geometric. That would be enough to kind of get started. And then we'll use like various tools and strategies that we have to help um, move the design process along. And really what that is, it's really an iterative process, right? So it's like, yes, no, I like it. Maybe, okay, close, you're getting closer. Okay, then it's you go back. But the faster you can do that, then the more, um, the quicker you can get to kind of like, aha, that's it, we got it, right? And it's discovery. So, you know, everyone wants to discover and that's really kind of one of the best things is when you discover something that it's you haven't seen it before and you know it's maybe out there but you haven't seen it and then when you see it you know it and that's really that that moment i think that really gets you know designers and architects and you know everybody involved in this built world is they want something you know special and unique and and, and very often you know personal it's sort of circling back with with the with the artists on our panel, and Sandra, I'll start with you. I, I want to talk to you about failure, because one of the things that uh, you mentioned, what? failure. Oh, failure. Oh, okay. Be, because, <laughs> well, because one of the things you mentioned mm -hmm. was you're experimenting with yeah. steel. Mm -hmm. And look, 
there is no exper- there is no there is no finished product there is no perf- there is no wonderful design without failure there oh. just isn't and you were talking a little bit about sort of the properties of steel and how much can you remove before it caves in on itself and and crumbles and i i was you know as you were talking i was thinking about a couple of things i was thinking about the process of failure and I, I'm interested in your process of failure. I was also thinking about sort of this wabi-sabi kind of thing, this idea where, you know, it's, and Mario, kind of to your point, we're getting to the finished product where maybe it's not perfect, mm-hmm. but the blemish makes it somehow better. And in your case, where you're working with a steel that's going to patina over years to actually change the the way it looks and I, so I'm curious, your yeah. process of failure. How do you how do you get how do you get content and happiness out of your failures? Oh well, that's I can absolutely address this. So imagine the the piece behind me is is 58 inches in diameter. I had two of these mooring buoys in my backyard. This is actually a photo of my backyard in Connecticut, where I'm not there now, but um, they were sitting there for about a year and a half. <laughs> waiting for for some magic to happen or magic or failure and unlike a, a, a sketch on tracing paper where you could you know like oh this this is terrible you know you 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 wad it up and you pitch it in the wastebasket if I screwed this up it would be pretty obvious so I it's not that I was afraid but I, I realized I had a big responsibility here because like what if this didn't work and when I describe it as a paper doll um, it's one thing to have this, uh, try and tr- create this soft pencil sketch on steel, which was my intention so that it was my hand, per, you know, handcrafted, cut, you know, plasma cut, every piece of it is handcrafted, but it was, it had to be engineered too, because it, it absolutely could have collapsed on itself. So it was a big experiment to see uh, how to take something which looked so solid and make it look nearly weightless, almost transparent. It's like a big diorama. So you see these images um, you know, through each other. You can, you, you can um, look through the piece with the fire inside. Um, I did a lot of paper mock-ups of things for other screens that I was working on to say, you know, I like that shape, how does that work? Um, so it is a lot of back and forth with, with the material itself and, and how far you can take it. In architecture, it kind of has to be perfect. <laughs> I mean, we like to use a technical term, we'll just fudge it, which means it doesn't really mean anything, but um, it, it has to work. And here I kind of had the luxury of imperfection in including my drawing style, where I liked the fact that it was, wasn't a crisp edge that it had to respond to the imperfections of the piece itself. Or, whoa, there's this like plug suddenly in the side. You know, what do I do with that? Well, you draw around it. And what I found is that it informed absolutely um, how I was working, how I felt about working on the piece. It was like I was having a dialogue with the material itself. And, um, And then you learn from collaboration with people who really do understand this material, which is, is a highlight for me to, uh, to learn about powder coating, for example. I know a ton about powder coating now and what works in certain environments and what does not. So these are all the component parts of um, taking a, an idea for a sculpture, a functional piece, and really making it work well (laughs) and not fail. Um, I wanted to mention one thing though that was, you were talking about um, experience and craftsmanship because I think that the craftsmanship uh, is so important even in environments that are like hospitality and luxury. What is is luxury? And maybe I'll throw this out for, for you, Josh, to lead us as a group. But I find that craftsmanship and experience and storytelling is, is, has become the luxury of our day. And, um, and I'm really trying to tap 
into that very happily um, with the work that I'm doing. You know, Sandra, thank you for that. And thank you for throwing it back. I'll, I'll share you know, a brief story with you. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to interview a, a, a dear friend of mine um, who I went to high school with. His name's Steve Sampson, and he is the uh, owner and head chef at Rosa Blue. If you're in downtown LA and you've ever been, it's this Northern Italian cuisine. It's it's mm -hmm. award-winning James Beard Award. He's, um, he's amazing. And when I was interviewing, he said something really interesting to me that just really struck out because I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine at the time, you know, any creative really telling me this, but he was, I was talking to him about the artistry of what he does. He was like, well, no, I am not an artist. I'm a craftsman. I'm not an artist. I'm a craftsman. And what he meant by that was that he's not trying to create. He's not, re he's not, he's not creating anything. He's purposefully crafting something to recreate what it is to remind people who have been in Northern Italy and had that original cuisine, when they taste it, it takes them back. And sort of to, to your idea, um, you know, I, I think that it, story is everything now in architecture, architecture is a language, right? And I feel like design is the narrative, you know, design sort of is the color behind the story, it's the character development. Yeah. Um, Nicole, same, same question to you about, I want to go back to the idea of failure because, you know, you are so specific about your ideas with string theory as it's as it relates to the work itself. It's a very strong story. It's a very strong narrative. Um, sometimes it's hard as, as creatives can attest to, it's hard to craft the product to match the story. So, and, and especially with, you know, your, your work, it looks, it looks gentle. I don't know how, how strong the, the material actually is, but it looks, it doesn't, it looks gentle. It looks like it would, it would be challenging to work with, to maybe craft into your own idea of what it is. What was that process like for you? And did you have to compromise at all? Well, uh, okay. So I just want to start kind of with my my original art, because I wanted to touch back on what Sandra was saying. So my original art is photography based and it's, you know, shown, I mean, it's commissioned by um, residential, commercial and hospitality. And um, I'm seeking out the imperfections like Sandra is too. I'm out there photographing what may be seen as discarded or unsightly. And I try to, um, and I take it and I feel like I create, my work has a very peaceful, um, feel to it. it, it just emanates that into a room. And, and so for me, those imperfections are exciting. You know, the stray marks, the scratches, you know, the sun that's bleached paint, because I'm, I'm, I'm photographing architectural elements. Oh. So all of that wear and tear of just life coming and going, I, there's a beauty to it. And then photographing it close up and then putting it into abstract expressionism, you know, into this abstract form where people don't recognize what I am actually you know showing in my work is is exciting they just feel the energy of it and then going into uh you know my my sculpture this was my first you know the universe sculpture again it was based on string theory it's made out of glass I'm working with Las Vit um which is a Czech um, bohemian um glass maker from from the Czech Republic they do these monumental um, sculptures and chandeliers really yeah. quite spectacular and um, so working with them it was really very easy they have a you know a crew of engineers and designers you know I can present them with the concept which is this and they know how to realize it you know um, with my second sculpture um, oculus universe this is again you know based in the string theory but it's supposed to be more personal experience. So when you walk into it and you sing to it or meditate to it, it will progressively light up around you in your own personal universe. And this one is out of a um, fiberglass composite. And you know, I really wanted to work with Las Vit on it again, but glass was not the element that could be worked with. It was, you know, you can imagine someone wanting to take a selfie on this. <laughs> and so we needed something that was strong. And the, you know, the fiberglass of, of these days is, um, is not the fiberglass of the 1970s. 
And so I found a, a fabricator here in Los Angeles who actually will pour a mold and it's done in module elements that can be um, interchanged so that you know each sculpture will actually vary. So if you're pick, you know, I'm I'm visualizing a field of these of at least three, right? And uh, and they will vary slightly. So you can walk through them and they have LED lights in them. So it will progressively light up. And then um, and then back to kind of like failures. I remember the beginning of my career um, when I was working on my regular art, I, I thought that, I mean, this is years ago, right? You're, you're, there's a learning curve to everything. And I thought framing it in glass, I couldn't possibly use plexiglass, but I had these six, you know, five foot pieces and with these thin frames, because I'm starting out and you know, I'm a new artist, I don't have a huge budget. And so my, my glass was cracking. <laughs> Every time I pick it up and move it, the glass would crack and my, my framer, he just didn't, you know, he didn't educate me. I needed that education. So it was, it was really quite an experience. Now I, now I do basically, it's a, you know, acrylic face mount. So there's no cracking and breaking and I can, you know, the one behind me that is showing here is 16 feet. It was for a client in, in um, Washington DC and it's, uh, it's in, you know, it's in panels, they fit together. It's really beautifully fabricated now and I don't have a problem with anything breaking anymore. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's really interesting. I love that you brought that up. And and Christine, just a note for you. Next time we are we are out of time for this conversation um, to get in depth into anything further. But Christine, next time I would love to do a a, a view with fabricators as it relates to the art of reimagined materials. Um, with that, I just I I want to thank you so much, Nicole, Mario, Sandra, Sue. Thank you very much for taking the time to have this conversation. Thank you, um, A. Rudin. Spencer, thank you guys for, for sponsoring this. Thank you to the Pacific Design Center for allowing us to have this, this chat. And thank you, Christine Anderson, for putting it all together and producing it. This was so much fun. And I, I just, I love the fact that having four incredibly creative people having a conversation like this is so much fun. And I will just say last time that um, my hope is that next time we all get to do it in person and I can't wait to see you uh, in person. With that, um, thank you. And uh, everyone, thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.